So by the time that you are finished with this presentation, I hope that you will have enough information to take care of 90% of the renal issues that your patients will present with. This is in, not just an anatomy talk. This is a clinical talk, clinically oriented nephrology. By the time we're finished with this, and it's a little long, as you'd expect from me, you should have everything you need to know to walk in and take care of a patient and hopefully remove um, a lot of the minutiae that's in your head. And I'll tell you what minutiae is important, what you need to hang on to, and what you need to forget about. Um, so uh, make sure that you do read the slide comments uh, as those will be uh, very important as we move along. On this uh, cyber anatomy clip that I put here, take a look at how that superior mesenteric artery uh, crosses over the renal vein and the duodenum. Uh, we will learn about nutcracker syndrome and we will also learn about SMA syndrome. But it turns out that this cyber anatomy image is really pretty good when it comes to showing us the anatomy of the renal system and especially when we're trying to learn about stuff like nutcracker syndrome and then the order of the vessels that come into the hilum of the kidney. Usually it's the vein, then the artery, and then posterior, it's the ureter. But we'll talk about that because there are variations. So as we move on, there is uh, some required reading. It's a PDF file and I pre-read it for you. I highlighted all the important stuff and uh, I'll give you these other two resources to read. Um, you don't have to read them, but this one's required. And like I said, I pre-read it, and so it's going to have some highlight on it, and it should make sense to you. And then down here, if you click on this link, it'll take you to my YouTube channel, and uh, there's about half a dozen small videos, just a couple of minutes in length each one, um, that are relevant to this lecture and to the care of your patient, like uh, what a cystoscopy looks like and how they put in your redural stents, for example. That might be something that you'll uh, end up sending a patient to get. Um, or maybe you want to go into urology or nephrology. Hopefully it's all here and hopefully it'll make sense. But make sure you read this uh, article here. Um, there's a lot of learning objectives. If you want to download them, you can download them as a doc file here. Um, there are like 40 objectives and we're going to go through every one of these. Uh, because they are important and they are not minutia. Uh, so hopefully by the time that you've downloaded these and we've gone through them here in the lecture, uh, you'll know exactly uh, what's expected of you and clinically uh, what's expected of you. So let's start out with number one here. What is the white line of Tolt and how is it useful in the dissection of the colon and the retroperitoneum to expose the kidney? Well, right here's the white line of Tolt over here. You can see the membrane covering up the retroperitoneum. Well, the ascending colon is covered with anteriorly, covered with uh, a peritoneum, but its backside of the ascending colon and the backside of the descending colon are not covered. They're just stuck to the sidewall and covered up like with saran wrap over the top of them. Well, where that saran wrap reflects off of the colon and onto the sidewall of the peritoneal cavity, where that uh, membrane then becomes contiguous with the uh, peritoneum itself is what we call the white line of Tolt. And this is really helpful in the operating room because we can grab that colon, pull it towards us, and it tents this layer right here. And we just take our cautery and we just divide right behind by it. And then before you know it, if you divide in the right spot, it'll lead you up to the kidney. So that's why this is important because sometimes we have to get access to the kidney. Gerotus fascia is this very thin layer of fascia over the kidney. This retroperitoneal membrane um, right there is Gerotus fashion. If we look at it in cross section here, we know that there's fat, perinephric fat right here. And then there's this anterior membrane that goes over the kidney. And then there's this posterior membrane that goes over the kidney. Um, if you could take off this small, thin membrane here of the retroperitoneum, you would find Gerotus fascia. And I'll be honest with you, most of the time, this anterior fascia right here is actually fused with this retroperitoneal membrane. This anterior fascia and this are usually fused in one layer. It's just almost impossible to separate them. So this is Gerotus fascia. Um, why is Gerotus fascia important? We'll get to that in just a little bit. And then what's the usual anterior to posterior anatomical structures at the renal hilum? Well, if we look back on uh, 
our previous page, uh, you'll see that the, the way the kidney is uh, oriented in the human body, that the left renal vein crosses over the um, aorta, which means anteriorly, the renal vein is anterior, in the middle then is going to be artery, and then posteriorly is going to be the ureter or the collecting system proper. And then how is this mnemonic helpful in helping you to remember it, to remember this um, vein, artery, and then uh, ureter is right here. Vein, artery, ureter. And then this last one is for a segmental artery. Um, not so important. So what is the hierarchy of the renal blood supply beginning with the renal artery and ending with the uh, efferent arterial? We will show how the renal artery divides and finally moves into uh, lobar branches and then lobular branches and then uh, various arcades until it gets down to the point where it's actually ending in the efferent arterial and the portion of that renal artery that makes up um, a glomerulus. And then why can't the left why can the left vein, excuse me, why can the left renal vein be ligated without affecting the function of the left kidney? Well, there's a variety of tributaries into the left vein. Uh, most notably, there is um, the uh, gonadal vein. And then does this help explain why nutcracker syndrome is rarely diagnosed? If so, how? Remember, these veins are draining into the left renal vein, not the other way around. The renal vein does not drain into the gonadal vein. But nutcracker syndrome is where the uh, superior mesenteric artery uh, overlies the left renal vein and it pinches it, causes some congestion on the left kidney. I have never knowingly seen a case of this, so it's pretty rare. And then what percentage of cases will the renal artery be anterior to the renal vein? Um, up here, we just told you that it's vein, artery, ureter, and then segmental artery. How many times is it artery, vein, ureter? Well, it's about 30% of the cases. Um, anatomically, when we say the water runs under the bridge, we're referring to how the ureter crosses under the gonadal vessels at the level of the inferior pole of the kidney. And then where can the ureter be located as it enters the pelvis? Hint, if you can find the bifurcation of the common iliac artery into um, the internal iliac and the external iliac artery, you can find where the uh, ureter crosses over the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. It's a good place to find the ureter in the operating room. And then in females, where does the water run under the bridge again and a hint is it's going to be near the uh, uterine artery i'll show you some pictures so that this will make sense this is an anatomical mnemonic to help the surgeon locate the ureter and avoid injury to the ureter so when dissecting the ureter and the pelvis the pelvic peritoneum should be in size medial to the ureter why um, it's because the blood supply to the ureter in the pelvis actually enters laterally to the ureter and we want to avoid that what is a post-void residual? Well, after you urinate, there's a little bit of urine left in the bladder. Normally, it should be less than 75 cc's. We uh, measure that by using uh, ultrasound. A nurse will often go into a patient's uh, room in the hospital if he can't urinate. They can ultrasound the bladder and give you an idea of how much urine's in the bladder. We can do the same after we put a catheter in, drain all the urine out of you, and go in and check the post-void residual. Or we can do it after you urinate. If you have a really high post-void residual in a man, it can be a sign of uh, an enlarged prostate. What is the average glomerular filtration rate in the average sized adult? But it's about 125 cc's a minute or about 180 liters a day, which is about 30 times your average blood volume. So your kidneys are filtering about 30 times your average blood volume every day with the average glomerular filtration rate 125 milliliters every minute i mean here's a picture that shows the gfr and the, where you're in trouble where you have kidney disease and where it should be between 60 and 120 cc's a minute so what is annulin and why is it considered the ideal glomerular marker and why is it considered the gold standard for measuring the gfr we'll talk about that um, and then if inulin is the gold standard, how come instead of using inulin, we use the serum creatinine to measure the GFR? Uh, does using the serum creatinine 
over or underestimate the true GFR? Well, it overestimates it um, by about 20%. And if so, by how much? By about 20%. What is the difference between creatine and creatinine? Creatine um, is the muscle uh, breakdown product. Creatinine is the further breakdown product of creatine. What is cystatin C and what it's used for? Um, we know that renin is a protease. Where is it produced? It's produced in the granular cells of the afferent arterial. When is it released? It is released in response to decreases in renal artery perfusion pressure. So as blood flow to the kidney drops, then the kidney sees that as help. I need more blood and I need more oxygen and it produces renin. And then where is angiotensin produced? How is angiotensin 1 produced? The answer, by reacting with renin from the kidney. And then how does angiotensin 1 get converted to angiotensin 2? Well, it's subjected to the angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, uh, which is in the lungs. So what is the effect of angiotensin 2? Well, it's a vasoconstrictor in the efferent arterial that reduces reduces renal blood flow by maintaining or increased filtration. Think about that for a sec. If we pinch off the efferent arterial, then everything proximal to that, the pressure head will increase. So by doing that, we're actually increasing our filtration um, through the uh, uh, glomerulus and through the afferent arterial. Um, angiotensin II also acts on the adrenal cortex causes the release of aldosterone, which helps to stimulate sodium reabsorption and sodium bicarb, um, sodium bicarb resorption. And at higher levels, angiotensin II causes a generalized vasoconstriction, including constriction of afferent and efferent arterioles, which helps to maintain a centralized arterial blood pressure increase. And in doing so, it sacrifices the renal blood flow and the filtration to the kidney. So what is the effect of aldosterone? We just went through that. And atrial nat natriuretic peptide, AMP, on the solute concentration of urine. Well, it mostly acts on the reabsorption of sodium and sodium ions. And then chloride follows the sodium ion passively. And then what is ADH, antidiuretic hormone? Where is it released? It is released from the posterior lobe of the pituitary. Why is it released? It is released in response to a decreasing concentration of water in body fluids or to a decreasing blood volume and blood pressure. The purpose of this is the reabsorption of water by osmosis, and it leads to a concentrated urine. Think about the name of this hormone, antidiuretic hormone. A diuretic makes you pee. An antidiuretic makes you hold on to your fluid. How does the body do that? It does that by osmosis, by holding on to water via osmosis. This is secreted by the posterior lobe of the pituitary. So, and then in acid-base balance, we know the kidney acts to reclaim sodium bicarb in the excretion of acid. Um, and how can this result then in a hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis or a hypernatremic, hyper chloremic metabolic acidosis, low potassium, alkalosis, high potassium, acidosis. And then to what ion is the hydronium ion attached for excretion in urine? Well, it gets attached to the ammonia molecule to make an ammonium ion, and then you pee, and that's why your urine smells like ammonia. Um, there are three forms of vitamin D. What are they and where are they produced? Okay. Uh, vitamin D, uh, turns out that it's important not only to keep our bones strong, but it's produced partially in the kidney and partially in the liver. So active form of vitamin D3 known as calcitriol, that's important, 3, triol. Uh, cholecalciferol is converted to calcidiol in the liver. And then the kidney converts the calcidiol to the calcitriol. So calci uh, calcidiol is made in the liver, calcitriol is made in the kidney. So here's the way it works. Cholecalciferol, precursor to vitamin D, goes to ergocalciferol in the liver, ergo, ergots. Um, ergot is, of course, like mushrooms, and mushrooms are 
uh, toxic to the liver. And then it goes to calcitriol in the kidney, which is the active form of vitamin D. And then which form would be preferred in a patient with end-stage renal disease? Well, if they have end-stage renal disease, their kidney's not going to be able to do that second hydroxylation. So we need to give them the full molecule, the calcitriol. Um, and then if the kidney is failing, it also cannot make erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a uh, hormone that um, the body excretes via the kidney to help increase the uh, red cells and maintain our red cell volume so that we don't get anemic. The body is constantly turning over red cells by filtrating it through the spleen, um, and we need erythropoietin to make sure that we keep up the growth of our red cells in the bone marrow. So that these they're called EPOs, ESAs, uh, the erythropoiesis stimulating agents, the ESAs, um, are not indicated in the ICU to treat an acute anemia. Um, and then what is a known side effect of these? Hypertension. Too much erythro, uh, ethro, too much ESAs and the patient gets hypertensive. Totally makes sense. Too much blood uh, filling up the pump and you're going to get uh, hypertensive. Think about this. This is EPO is also what uh, guys like Lance Armstrong used to shoot themselves up with when they would uh, prep for the Tour de France. Um, and uh, of course, some of these guys suffered from hypertension. In, in addition to using steroids, n nobody was surprised when um, Lance Armstrong came down with testicular tumor because the use of exogenous steroids and cancer of the uh, testicles is well known. So even he didn't really have to even admit to uh, shooting up using EPO or um, doping, as he called it, because we all knew, at least all the doctors in America knew that when he... Uh, was treated for testicular cancer that he was probably cheating. Um, how is acute kidney injury defined? And then list the definitions of these two systems. And we'll go through that because they're really similar. Um, and these are very clinical. There's there's not any minutiae here. You're going to recognize these um, kidney injuries in your own patients. So here, uh, using the KDIGO, and we'll talk about what that means, um, if you have an increase in your serum creatinine by 0.3 or more in 48 hours, you should be worried. Um, if your serum creatinine goes up by one and a half in uh, the prior seven days over baseline, or if your urine volume is less than a half a cc per kilogram per hour for six hours, you have to be worried that you have acute kidney uh, injury. Using the rifle mnemonic, risk, injury, failure, loss of kidney function, and end-stage renal disease, we can also see that there are certain definitions that meet impending renal failure. Now, when I say renal failure, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking about the kidney failing. We could be talking about pre-renal failure or post-renal failure. We'll talk about what that means. Again, all this is really clinical, but things that will, that will tip you off, if the patient's creatinine goes up, if it goes up uh, one and a half, two to three times normal, those are going to be red flags for you. If they have loss of kidney function for more than four weeks, and if that continues for more than three months based on an increase in serum creatinine, a decrease in the glomerular filtration rate, or a drop in the urine output, um, all these things are pretty common sense when it comes to figuring out whether your patient has uh, impending uh, uh, kidney failure or not. So what is the usual cause of prerenal azotemia? Um, and acute kidney injury. Well, the number one cause of pre-renal azotemia, meaning failure before the blood gets to the kidney, is usually from low blood pressure um, or something that makes the glomerular filtration rate fall. And then how does it manifest in its lab results? Well, usually um, if we can't send the blood to the kidney, we can't get rid of the um, ammonia and uremic byproducts, and then we have an increase in the blood urea nitrogen level. Makes sense. Um, and how does it manifest clinically? Well, the patient doesn't make as much urine. He has a decreasing concentration of urine sodium, means he's peeing out urine sodium, and it has a high urine osmolality. Uh, what causes this renal hyper? hypoperfusion? Well, it could be a loss of uh, blood. It could be hypotension. It could be dehydration. Uh, and then this kicks in to form the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system uh, and the production of antidiuretic hormone. 
So list some causes of pre-renal azotemia. Uh, we'll talk about that. I just mentioned some uh, blood loss and diarrhea, vomiting, um, dehydration. How is pre-renal acute kidney injury managed? Well, we replace you. Uh, we replace all of those things that are causing uh, a drop in pressure. So we're going to give you a fluid via IV, or we might have to give you vasopressors, or we might have to give you blood. Um, the problem with giving blood is it is has high in protein because of those red cells. So you have to uh, be aware of when you're giving blood to somebody who has prerenal azotemia that you could make the BUN go too high. Um, what is a hepatorenal syndrome? And how is it different from other kinds of renal failure? Why is it a diagnosis of exclusion? Well, hepatorenal syndrome is a premorbid condition. It is caused by the splenic and systemic vasodilatation along with renal vasoconstriction leading to a decrease in blood flow. It's usually premorbid. The patient uh, usually is going to die if this shows if they show failure of liver failure and kidney failure at the same time. And then how is it distinct from pre-renal causes? Well, if I think you're pre-renal and I give you a liter and a half of crystalloid and your kidney function doesn't improve, your urine output doesn't improve, your creatinine doesn't drop, then it's a pretty good sign that you might be in a renal syndrome both. And then what is post-renal failure? This is anything that happens after the kidneys filtrated uh, the blood in the serum. So distal to the kidney, like um, if we pinch off the ureter, um, or if your Foley catheter gets plugged, or if an old guy has a big prostate and he can't pee, it blocks off the flow of urine out of the body. That's called post-renal failure. Um, I told you there were a lot of objectives, but they're all really clinically important. So just bear with me. Um, how is post-renal failure managed? Well, you got to Get rid of the obstruction. You got to clean the catheter, or flush the catheter, or, or help the guy and trim his prostate down so he can pee. Um, in other cases, we might have to do a urinary diversion. In the in the event that there's a cancer pinching off a ureter, we might have to go in there and plug the ureter in somewhere else. Or if a surgeon accidentally cuts a ureter during surgery, it happens. Um, and then renal failure can be divided into besides. Um, in general, pre-renal, post-renal, this is actually referring to renal failure of the kidney itself. The kidney is dying. So these are things that can cause the kidney to die. Sepsis, uh, not enough oxygen, not enough blood flow, toxins, drugs, and myoglobin from muscle breakdown, a crush injury or a burn injury or someone who's been uh, hit by lightning can cause myoglobin and this blocks the tubules and you cannot uh, make urine if your tubules are uh, not open and if the tubules are not open and uh, filtering the urine. So acute tubular necrosis, you'll hear this a lot. Dr. Fish will talk about this, but actually um, there's not little necrosis. Instead, it's the formation of casts and detachment of the tubular cells from their basement, basement membrane. So the cells are not really necrotic. Thus, acute tubular necrosis is a misnomer. So that that's a little minutia, but it, it it's just another thing that science has taught us that what we used to think was necrosis really isn't necrosis. Um, and then there can be diseases of the interstitium itself. Acute interstitial nephritis um, most commonly results from allergic reactions to drugs in a surgical setting. So at this point, this isn't something that you need to memorize, but if your kidney does suffer from acute interstitial nephritis, you have to think that it may be an allergic reaction. And then, of course, there are diseases of the glomeruli. So I warned you there's a lot of physiology in this lecture as well as clinical relevance and some anatomy. So let's keep going. So how can acute kidney injury be prevented perioperatively? The best way to do this is don't let the patient get hypotensive and of course, that applies to a surgical patient, but it also applies to any patient in the hospital. Any element of hypotension less than a mean arterial pressure of 55 for one minute can cause acute kidney uh, injury. And then what drugs have we tried and have they worked? Dopamine, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, uh, N-acetylcysteine, atrial natriuretic peptide, sodium bicarb, antioxidants. 
EPO, uh, normal saline, lactated ringers, Hespan. Have they worked? We've tried all these things, and you know what? None of them work. So um, that leaves us back to square one. So what has had a major role in preventing acute kidney injury in the perioperative period? There it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. An intraoperative blood pressure management <clears throat> to keep your patient's blood pressure greater than a mean arterial pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury um, is going to be the best thing that you can do. So list the some medications that can actually cause acute kidney injury. Non-steroidals, Motrin, Naproxen, Toradol, um, ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin receptor blockers, aminoglycoside antibiotics such as genomycin, um, famous for causing deafness and also for killing your kidneys uh, if, if the level's not regulated. Uh, Beta-lactam antibiotics, Vanco, Ampho, and sulfonamides, uh, drugs like Bactrim, which is uh, <clears throat> sulfamethoxazole and uh, trimethoprim. So these are some of the ones that can cause acute kidney injury. Probably the most common right here, Motrin, those uh, over-the-counter uh, pain medications. And then what traditionally has been the resuscitative fluid of choice? Well, I taught you in the um, shock lecture that it was normal saline. But recent studies... And I mentioned this at the time that studies go up and down. Recent studies say that hyperkalemia uh, secondary <clears throat> to uh, too much normal saline results in a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, despite its lack of potassium. Think about that for a minute. I give you a whole bunch of normal saline. It causes uh, hyperkalemia, a hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. And it's also been implicated in decreasing renal blood flow. So we tried some buffered crystalloids and we put some bicarb in it. And they didn't reduce the risk of uh, acute kidney injury. So there's no perfect uh, solution that you will give to try to prevent this acute kidney injury. Um, should diuretics be used? No, they shouldn't. Um, and when should they be used? Only if the patient's in fluid uh, overload. Somebody who uh, has congestive heart failure, let's say. And then how can we protect our kidneys against damage from uh, IV contrast agents, the iodine-containing uh, agents that we use for our CAT scans? We uh, do IV hydration. We try to use a non-ionic isoosmolar contrast. Yes, they exist. And we used to give N-acetylcysteine for 48 hours orally before the procedure, uh, if you can. And, but the problem is it didn't show any improvement in the contrast-induced nephropathy. And then the question, should it be used? Well, it's cheap. It doesn't do any harm. It's easy to take orally. But if it doesn't work, why give it? <clears throat> and then when should dialysis be implemented? And here's a mnemonic to help you remember that, A-E-I-O-U, the vowels. Uh, acidosis, uh, when there is severe metabolic acidosis, your pH is less than 7.2. That uh, is a bad thing. So if you have a pH of 6.8, you're probably not going to go out of, get out of the hospital. If your potassium is sky high, greater than 6.5, and you can't get it down by using uh, k exalate or your patient can't take oral therapy, or you can't give them potassium and insulin, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, give them uh, insulin and uh, dextrose to try to get it down, not potassium. The potassium is already high enough. Um, if they've taken toxins, <clears throat> number one toxin that kills the kidneys is antifreeze. Uh, if they're volume overloaded and they have pulmonary edema that is not responsive to our diuretics, you might have to put them on dialysis. Um, the same is true for um, antifreeze. Or if a patient has severe uremia and they've developed a pericarditis, pericardial effusion, they have a metabolic encephalopathy or they have an encephalopathy secondary to uh, liver damage, like cirrhotics, will get too much ammonia in their um, <clears throat> bloodstream and they can't pee it out. And so they get goofy from all the ammonia. So those patients might actually need uh, dialysis. In that case, you're not necessarily getting rid of volume. You're trying to get rid of the ammonia. And of course, <clears throat> if they have uh, bleeding as a consequence of the uremia, and then depending on how bad the azotemia is, how high the BUN is, how low the urine output is, you might have to consider uh, 
um, using dialysis. <clears throat> so then a little bit on kidney transplants here. After a patient's donated his or her kidney for the transplant, what's the expected glomerular filtration rate of that patient? Believe it or not, it's about 70%. The other kidney takes up the uh, load from the other from the donated kidney, you'd think it'd be 50%, and it's not. It's actually greater than that, 70%. And then what surgical specialty is responsible for the most ureteral injuries? Laparoscopic gynecological procedures. Um, and where is the most common ureteral injury? It's in the distal uh, ureter. <clears throat> and then what is the most common ureteral injury besides having gynecological surgery is inadvertent ligation of the ureter, putting a tie around it. Um, and then how can we prevent it? Number one, we're going to show you some tricks to identify the ureter and use meticulous dissection, identify it, and know where to cut and how to cut around it. Um, what is the most widely used radiologic procedure to identify a delayed ureteral injury? It's called CT urography, and basically that's where we give you contrast and it hopefully is non-ionic contrast. And we get a picture of the kidneys and we get a picture of the kidneys in the uh, filtration phase and then the excretory phase. And we can see the contrast light up in the kidneys and light up in the ureters and in the bladder or not. So that's something else to think about. And then summarize the most common causes of renal failure, pre-renal, uh, usually hypotension, not enough blood flow to the kidney, Renal, uh, something that we're giving that'll kill the kidney um, or cause uh, acute tubular necrosis. And then if we use, have post-renal failure, uh, we block off the kidney from draining uh, or we pinch off the vein and uh, they get varicosities of the venous system. So some more things that we're going to learn is describe how the BUN creatinine ratio changes in the various types of renal failures that I just mentioned. Notice it's creatinine, not creatine. Creatinine is the metabolic byproduct of creatine. Um, what is a Foley catheter? What's it used for? Um, name a specific type of Foley catheter and what it's used for. The answer to this is called a CUDE tipped uh, catheter. What is post-obstructive diuresis? Why is it dangerous? And given an uh, example of an electrolyte abnormality, you'd see in post-obstructive diuresis and usually it's hypernatremia. Uh, too much uh, sodium is retained. What is the normal urine output for a child or an adult? How is it calculated? You gotta memorize this. 0.5 to one cc per kilo per hour. This works for kids and adults. Pediatricians like the one cc, adults like the 0.5 cc, but between a half and one cc per kilo per hour. So on those nights where you're an intern and the nurse calls you up and says, Mr. Smith isn't peeing, you need to know how much does Mr. Smith weigh. Use an ideal body weight. <clears throat> um, and then what is the fractional excretion of sodium? It's pronounced a FINA, fractional excretion of sodium, FINA. What is it used for? How is it calculated? And why is it used? Why is it useful? Um, let's talk about erythropoietin. We mentioned that earlier and its role in treatment of anemia. Where is it made? Well, it's made in the kidney and it acts in the bone marrow. And how is it related to renal and hepatic physiology? What is renal artery stenosis? How do we diagnose it? Um, we can diagnose it with a CTA, an MRA, an ultrasound, and sometimes you can diagnose it on physical exam if you can hear a brewery in the flank region. How is it treated? Uh, usually with a stent. Surgery sometimes might be necessary, but today most of the time it's with a stent. And what is the mechanism by which it causes hypertension? It's the renal angiotensin um, cascade, same thing. And then using VH dissector or a CT scan uh, and on a transverse section, make sure that you can identify the ureter, the kidney, the medulla of the kidney, the cortex of the kidney, the pyramids of the kidney, um, the collecting system near the hilum, the renal vein, the renal arteries. Make sure you can find the SMA, the IMA, the adrenal glands, the psoas muscle, and the quadratus lumborum muscles. So here's some things that you absolutely must memorize. If you don't take anything away from this presentation, put these little nuggets in your brain, okay? <clears throat> memorize a normal urine output, 0.5 to one cc per kilogram per hour. You need to know that to be a doctor. You must know this. This is not negotiable. Memorize this, memorize this, memorize this. Last year, 
Kids couldn't do it. I don't know why. I told them a million times. Memorize it. Do not memorize the fractional excretion of sodium, but look at the formula. And just know that when you calculate your fractional excretion of sodium, normal value is less than 1%, meaning that your body should reabsorb about 99% of its sodium. If it doesn't, your kidney is not fil filtering properly and it's spilling out all the sodium in your urine. Number one cause of a low blood ure urea nitrogen, malnutrition. Nurse calls you in the middle of the night, it's two in the morning, Mr. Smith's blood work came back, his BUN is two, doctor, and you say thank you and go back to bed. Um, give him a freaking Big Mac or something. Give, give him some nutrition. A BUN creatinine ratio greater than 21 is indicative of pre-renal failure. Uh, BUN creatinine that is one uh, is probably renal failure. Um, the, if the creatinine rises out of proportion to the BUN, it's also a sign of renal failure. So if the BUN is 10 and your creatinine is 6, your kidneys are failing. Dialysis is usually, is usually reserved for creatinine greater than 13. And every increase in the creatinine by one, you drop the function of your kidney in half. So your patient has a creatinine of 1.0, that's normal. Tomorrow, they have a creatinine of two. That means they lost a kidney. They only have half of what they had yesterday. Tomorrow, they have a three, creatinine's three, which means now they have half of that one kidney. So now they're down to a half a kidney. Uh, the next day it goes to four. They have half of that half. Now they get a quarter of a kidney. You get the idea. Um, <clears throat> normal urine specific gravity is 10, 10. Memorize this, 10, 10. And also understand and memorize that hypo, hypo means alkalosis. Hypokalemic, hypochloremic, metabolic alkalosis. Okay. O, O, and O. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully that helps. So uh, here the white line at Tolt is the name of the peritoneal reflection onto the abdominal sidewall that holds the ascending and descending colons in place. In order to visualize the right kidney, the white line of Tolt is incised along the ascending colon, especially near the hepatic flexures um, and the splenic flexures of the descending colon. And in using this anatomical landmark along the secondarily uh, retroperitoneal structures of the ascending colon and descending colon, we can use the white line of Tolt to guide our dissection and expose the kidney. Same thing over here. If we follow it, we can expose the kidney. So Gerota's fascia is the fascia between the perirenal fat, perirenal fat, and the pararenal fat um, that lies anteriorly over the kidney. This landmark is important too because tumors that extend through the fascia are considered especially aggressive. And in our image, the anterior renal fascia is known as Gerota's fascia. It is this fascia. It's a layer of very thin connective tissue that holds a bleeding kidney and allows that kidney to tamponade itself. It is very thin. You can see through it. It's a very thin layer, but in cases of trauma, it can be helpful in preventing massive blood loss because of its tamponading effect. So in reality, what you see in this image, this is peritoneum overlying uh, the kidney, the C loop of the duodenum, you can see the peritoneal lining. And they're saying that Gerota's fascia is one layer deeper than this layer here, one layer deeper than the normal peritoneal covering. And I will tell you in clinical experience, for the most part, they're fused and it's one and the same. Um, so that's probably the single most important factor. So here we are looking at a cross section. Um, here is our pancreas. And then here is our membrane of the retroperitoneum right here. And you can see where they're starting to fuse. And so here we have what's called perirenal peri fat. Here is pararenal fat around here. And then in between those is this fascia layer. This is Gerota's fascia. And Gerota's fascia, I will tell you that right here, Gerota's fascia fuses right here and it becomes one layer, you can see through layer. So anyways, that's just to help you uh, know what Gerota's fascia is, is and uh, the importance when it comes to a kidney injury. Now, let's talk about the anatomy of the kidney from anterior to posterior. Normally, it's renal vein, renal artery, and then the ureter. So looking from anterior to posterior, renal vein, renal artery, anterior to posterior. 
So while there are recognized variations in the anatomy of the hilum, the most accepted falls in line using the monic V-U-U-A, vein, artery, ureter, and then segmental artery. This means from anterior to posterior, renal vein, renal artery, ureter, and posterior segmental artery. The normal anatomy is seen in the image here on the right. Um, and here we can see how nutcracker syndrome can develop and cause varicosities. So here in nutcracker syndrome, we have the superior mesenteric artery, which normally comes over the left renal vein. The vein is anterior like it should be, pinches off, and then you get these varicosities from the left gonadal vein, from the veins draining the kidney. This congestion can cause varicosities. It can cause a varicocele in a male. Um, you go down to examine the testes, uh, palpate the uh, uh, testes through the scrotum, and sometimes you can feel these varicosities. Um, but I have actually never knowingly diagnosed or seen nutcracker syndrome. But more importantly, if you understand the relationship between the inferior vena cava and the aorta, you'll see how the left renal vein lies across an anterior to the aorta and subsequently follows the same sequence as it enters the hilum of the kidney from anterior to posterior, vein, artery, ureter. Interestingly, the left renal vein receives three tributaries. The left adrenal vein, this puppy right there, and <clears throat> the left gonadal vein and a lumbar vein. So if the main renal vein is compromised or if it's pinched in nutcracker syndrome or ligated, these three tributaries could allow for the dra uh, venous drainage of the kidney to continue as long as um, they are not subjected to being pinched here. So blood flow could return from the gonads up here, be varicosity, and come out this way and then drain up through a left adrenal vein. But the problem is the left adrenal vein has to drain down. So unless there's reversal of flow somewhere, um, how is that gonna help? Well, you might actually get some reversal of flow if you truly have a nutcracker syndrome. And maybe that's why we don't uh, uh, see it that commonly. So, and, and remember, there are no valves in these veins here. These veins do not have valves. So you could get reversal of flow here. Um, <clears throat> I've seen several patients with varicosities of their pampiniform plexus, uh, male patients around the uh, uh, testes. Um, but now that we've focused on this normal anatomy so much, we have to remember that in about 30% of cases, the renal artery actually can be anterior and not the renal vein. That happens in about 30% of cases. So the renal artery would enter the hilum and it would split into... Uh, a segmental artery, and then it goes to a, if we look at this picture over here, renal artery, you then go into a segmental artery, and then eventually it goes uh, up into an interlobar artery. One of these puppies here goes into interlobar artery, and then uh, it'll go to an arcuate artery, one of these branches here. Here's an arcuate artery here, arcuate vein that goes with it. Um, and eventually... The arcuate artery then goes to an interlobular artery. So here's an interlobular artery here. So arcuate artery, and then an interlobular artery, and then eventually into the afferent arterial, which you guess what? These are little puppies right here out in the cortex. These little puppies right there that form the glomeruli, and then eventually give to an efferent arterial. So there's your answer to learning objective number four. So while I don't think it's important to memorize the order of this renal arterial structure, if you understand it, you'll uh, be able to better understand blood flow and the filtration of the kidney. And, and here it is written out for you. Um, there might be some minor differences in what I just told you, but you get the idea. So let's talk about... Uh, the answers to learning objective number seven and number eight. <clears throat> so while not really that important to the non-surgeon, a brief understanding, <clears throat> excuse me, a brief understanding of the passage of the ureter to other vital structures because important becomes important to any physician if the patient's being worked up for renal failure. So speaking only of the ureter, speaking only of the ureter, we can bring attention to post-renal failure, i.e. damage to the outflow of the kidney, either 
either the renal vein or the ureter is blocked off. For example, if a patient develops a pelvic tumor and it pinches off on the ureter, it can result in hydronephrosis, blood in the urine, flank pain, etc. In addition, ureteral obstruction, of course, can cause kidney failure. So in this uh, illustration, there are three areas where the ureter can be readily identified. The saying that, quote, water runs under the bridge is often used by surgeons when describing the tortuous movement of the ureter from the kidney towards the bladder distally. The upper ureter runs adjacent to a slightly posterior and deeper. So here's our ureter running posterior to this uh, gonadal uh, artery right here. <clears throat> so as a surgeon locates a large pelvic vessels, i.e. the common iliac artery down here, and where it bifurcates into the internal and external iliac artery, these large vessels help the surgeon locate the ureter since it crosses those vessels at the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. This is a good area to pay attention to right there. So in this case, um, I've heard it said that the water runs over the bridge. So does it run under the bridge or over the bit bridge? Well, up here it runs under the bridge, and at the bifurcation it runs over the bridge. So I don't think that it's a terribly useful mnemonic, but you'll hear it in the operating room. Um, as the ureter moves distally towards the bladder and then enters the pelvis, <clears throat> As the ureter moves distally towards the bladder and enters the pelvis, the blood supply to the ureter comes laterally, laterally to the ureter. And it comes from these smaller vessels, the superior vesicle artery, the ureter artery, middle rectal artery, vaginal artery, inferior rectal artery. These are tiny little branches. These are small, tiny branches, but they're important. So when we dissect or we're trying to find the ureter down here, taking out a, a cancer of the colon or the rectum, we identify the ureter. We want to do our dissection over here. We want to expose the ureter from its medial aspect. Stay away from the lateral aspect. Because number one, you get into bleeding and these are small, tiny vessels and they just irritate you when they bleed. Um, so in summary, dissection of the upper ureter would be done from the lateral aspect to avoid the medial line gonadal vessel and then medially in the pelvis. So up in the upper abdomen, we dissect lateral. Down in the pelvis, we go medial. So then there's one other landmark that you need to know. If you've had a patient that develops an intra-abdominal aortic aneurysm, you'll want to know, does it affect the renal arteries or not? If they get an aneurysm of their aorta, does it, that aneurysm involve the renal arteries? You hope not because it's so much more difficult to re-implant those renal arteries and not result in kidney failure. Um, the important landmark that defines what we call an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm is the left renal vein. So your surgeons will dissect up to the left renal vein and be very careful about not punching a hole in it because it bleeds like filling a swimming pool from the bottom up. You can't find the hole. Um, a surgeon will dissect up to the left renal vein and put the aortic cross clamp, cross clamp the aorta right there at that level, so the kidneys continue to get perfused um, and we can fix the aneurysm distally. We may have to reimplant uh, gonadal vessels, we may have to reimplant the inferior mesenteric artery, but we hopefully do not have to reimplant the SMA or the renal arteries. That's very difficult to do. So now that we have learned where the inadvertent ureteral injuries um, can usually occur, let's find out why they happen. It turns out that. Most ureteral injuries, in fact, about 65% based on data, is caused by laparoscopic gynecological operations. Uh, for example, a laparoscopic hysterectomy or a laparoscopic ovarectomy. The distal ureter is the most common site of injury, um, and the most common cause is, as I mentioned, inadvertent ligation or tying off the ureter accidentally. Um, we can avoid this by paying attention to what we're doing, doing a meticulous dissection, accurately identify the ureter at those points where we know uh, anatomically that they should be, um, as we discussed in the previous slide. And a ureteral injury is best diagnosed with a CAT scan. It's called CT urography. Um, we'll give the intravenous contrast. It'll light up the kidneys, and then we can do uh, what's called the nephrogenic phase where we can see the kidney, 
and then follow it down into the excretory phase where we can then follow the contrast down into the ureters and hopefully if there's no injury down into the bladder if there is an injury the uh, contrast will stop at the site of the injury or even worse if the ureter has been cut and unrecognized the contrast will flow out into the peritoneal cavity um, those are always a, a bad thing so let's take a look here at uh, the cross-sectional anatomy of the kidney and i'm not sure that the image on the left is anatomically correct a useful mnemonic to remember for the ap uh, order of the structures at the uh, hilum is VAUA, and we've mentioned this. So we have renal vein, renal artery, ureter, and then uh, renal pelvis and a posterior segment artery. The main renal artery branches into an anterior and a posterior branch. So the hierarchy of the renal artery blood supply is renal artery and then a segmental artery and then an interlobar artery um, and then an arcuate artery up here. And then we go to an interlobular artery, which would be even smaller down in here. And um, in fact, here's an interlobular artery here, these smaller ones. And afferent arterial, then the glomerulus, and then the efferent arterial. Um, so this is some interesting information about the left renal vein. Um, not only is it longer than the right renal vein, six to eight centimeters versus one to four centimeters, but the left renal vein receives three venous tributaries. They're a tributary from the left adrenal vein, the left gonadal vein, and the lumbar vein. And then these rich collaterals ensure the left kidney will continue to function even if the left renal vein is ligated. <clears throat> so regarding the left uh, image here and its seemingly incorrect description of the vessels at the hilum, in as many as 30% of cases, the renal artery actually may course anterior to the renal vein. So, of course, um, the course of the ureter has given way to an old saying because the ureter continues anteriorly on the psoas muscle and crosses under the gonadal vessels. We say the water runs under the bridge. Um, in this case, there is no bridge, but it refers to the ureter running under the vessels carrying blood, as we saw in the previous slide. Another uh, important intraoperative landmark to find the ureter, as it can be found anteriorly to the bifurcation of the common iliac uh, artery into the uh, internal iliac and the external iliac arteries. In females, the ureter crosses under the uterine artery. Again, water under the bridge before it enters the bladder. Interestingly, because of the ureter's blood supply, incisions in the pelvic peritoneum should be made, as we've already mentioned, medial to the ureter to preserve the laterally intine ureteral blood supply. So even though there's significant variability in the order of the structures at the high limit, it's usually understood that anteriorly it'll be the renal vein, in the middle would be the artery, and then posterior would be the ureter. But that doesn't always follow as we just learned. <clears throat> so after you've learned the anatomy of the kidney at the hilum, let's follow the renal artery into the kidney. The classic teaching again is renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, arcuate artery, interlobular artery, an afferent arteriole, uh, efferent arteriole after the glomerulus. And I don't think that you necessarily need to memorize this. Um, just follow them from smaller, from larger to smaller to see how they uh, enter the urine producing pyramids and the papilla of the uh, urine producing uh, anatomy of the kidney. So you can already see, go back and look at the previous slide, how different references draw their pictures a bit differently. That's why I don't want you to memorize this minutia because as a physician, your job is to make sure the kidney gets perfused, period. Get blood to the kidney, avoid hypotension, avoid nephrotoxic drugs, avoid clots to the renal artery, et cetera. That's going to be your job. I don't think anybody will ever ask you about the interlobular arteries or the afferent arterial or the efferent arterial. No one will ever ask you if the patient's arcuate artery is intact. Nobody cares. Just keep blood flow to the kidney and make sure that you're getting that kidney perfused so you can drip urine from those tiny little uh, papilla down into the uh, major and minor calyces. So here, um, the best way to look at this slide is to uh, blow it up, make it as large as you can, make it larger so you can see the details. So combined with the next slide, 
It helps you see more clearly where the urine producing structures are located and where macroscopically and microscopically the urine waste are produced. But don't get lost in the minutia in this presentation. Uh, in fact, this presentation is not about that. It's about how to practice medicine needed to identify, treat, and recognizing diseases of the urinary system without the need for all of this, uh, unfortunate, all of this minutia. So it's kind of cool to look and see where the urine producing portion of the kidney is located, that the nephron is up here into the cortex. The renal medulla, if we follow it down in the renal medulla is where we can actually see the uh, uh, loop of Henle coming from the, uh, down from the uh, Bowman's capsule, et cetera, um, where we can see the uh, afferent arterial blood coming in to the glomerulus out through the efferent arterial. Again, minutia, but this is where it happens in the kidney. So it's up in the cortex, and then those loop of Henle's drop down here into the uh, uh, renal medulla. Here's another picture. I just put this in here for completeness. Um, I don't see how memorizing this would ever help you take care of a patient, so just bear with me, and we got just a little bit more. If you're really confused about where all of the solutes are absorbed and reabsorbed and what defines the proximal tubule and the distal tubule and the afferent, efferent arterial, et cetera, et cetera, go ahead and memorize this slide, but I will never ask you these details because, quite frankly, taking care of a patient, this is not relevant. So these are always cool to look at some photos of the uh, nephron of the glomerulus. Um, I always love these photos. It's difficult to visualize the structures of the nephron and then being able to see a light microscopic image versus an electro, uh, excuse me, versus an, being able to see a light microscopic image versus an electronic micrograph to really make the details pop is impressive. So, okay, here's a glomerulus. Um, and this is where the blood starts to get filtered. So very cool. Light microscopy all the way down to electron micrographs. Very cool pictures. So before we talk about filtration and kidney failure, we need to know how much urine should a healthy kidney make. And after a healthy adult urinates, how much should be remaining in an, quote, empty bladder. So this amount is called a post-void residual and it should be about 75 cc's, less than 75 cc's. The average amount of urine production for a healthy human, baby or grown, and you gotta memorize this number, is between 0.5 to one cc per kilogram per hour. Pediatricians like to use the one cc per kilogram per hour, and for whatever reason, reserve the 0.5 cc kilogram per hour for adults, um, and that's about 30 cc's, an hour, 30 cc's an hour for an adult. Memorize these amounts in this formula. This is not minutia. You must know this. Nurses will call you, wake you up, and ask you um, why Mr. Smith isn't urinating, and you need to figure out if you need to give him fluid or he needs a new catheter. So we need to review some of the renal physiology. In short, the average glomerular filtration rate is about 125 cc's a minute, or about 180 liters a day. That's 30 times your average blood volume per day. Um, and how do we measure the GFR? Well, a substance called inulin is used, and it's considered the ideal, the gold standard to measure the glomerular filtration rate. And by looking at this, um, we can see that 125 uh, cc's per uh, minute of inulin go through um, the renal filtration system, and 125 cc's come out. So it's 100% uh, input and output through the kidney. Um, note that the amount of glucose in the urine should be zero, right here. Normal clearance is zero. So what do you think a diabetic would show? How high would a serum glucose need to be before the kidney starts to spill urine? Um, it varies on the individual, but it starts to get secreted uh, anywhere from about 200 to 250 milligrams per deciliter uh, concentration of glucose in the blood before it tops out the renal threshold. So some more, a uh, little bit of info here. Inulin is a polymer of fructose. It's freely filtered into the Bowman space and is neither reabsorbed nor secreted by the kidney, but you have to give it IV. But we usually use a serum creatinine to measure the glomerular filtration rate. Creatinine is an end product of muscle metabolism. However, unlike inulin, about 20% gets secreted into the urine. 
And this has the effect of causing an error in the calculation of the GFR, um, but it's close enough. Um, creatinine has been used for years. <clears throat> creatinine has been used for years, and we're going to continue to use it. So the formula for GFR is the creatinine in the urine divided by the creatinine in the plasma. That number times the flow rate of urine equals the creatinine clearance. So you can see the higher the plasma concentration of creatinine, the lower the clearance. And that allows us to use this as an estimate of the GFR. Remember, it's just an estimate, but it's good enough for almost all the patients we will be taking care of. Um, some intensivists have tried to use cystatin C, or depending on how you pronounce it, cystatin C, to measure GFR in an ICU patient. It hasn't caught on. Um, cystatin C is a non-glycosylated protein. It's considered more reliable as an estimate of GFR than using serum creatinine. It's not affected by age, gender, race, or muscle mass, and also does not suffer from a lag period for its uh, rise in early uh, acute kidney uh, injury. Um, but cystatin C is far from being commonly used, so let's stick with what we know and what the rest of the world uses regularly. Let's use the serum creatinine. So by the way, what's the difference between uh, creatine and creatinine? In short, they both come from normal, everyday uh, breakdown of muscle cells, but creatinine is a breakdown product of creatine, creatine phosphate, from muscle and protein metabolism. So take home message uh, on this slide here is that normally you shouldn't see any glucose in your urine un unless the patient's diabetic and they have a um, serum glucose that's between 200 and 250 and you'll start spilling glucose into your urine and then this inulin um, which we don't use but it would be the ideal perfect standard for measuring a gfr because inulin in is equal to inulin out uh, nothing gets absorbed and nothing gets secreted so um, just a, a review of some basic physiology there so let's talk about how we classify renal failure Okay, so let's go back and review the classification of renal failure, pre-renal, renal, and of course, post-renal. So pre-renal causes of renal failure could be renal artery stenosis, i.e. the blood coming into the kidney, a pre-renal source of uh, hypotension or lack of blood flow or atherosclerotic disease in the uh, renal artery. Hypotension, hypoperfusion, shock, dehydration, we've already mentioned this. Renal causes of renal failure, embryological causes, uh, glomerulonephritides, medications and toxins, and of course, trauma, uh, car wrecks, or getting stabbed directly into the kidney. Uh, one of the worst toxins, of course, is antifreeze. Um, famous cases of people who have been poisoned using antifreeze. Um, and of course, the glomerulonephritis and uh, its uh, related diseases. Post-renal, could be anything that causes obstruction of the process after it's left the kidney. And I include in that not only ureteral obstruction or urethral obstructions, but I include in that uh, renal vein obstructions and renal vein diseases or nutcracker syndrome or even um, uh, renal cell carcinoma that has a tendency to, to crawl not only back through the renal vein, but up into the inferior vena cava. So let's take a look here at, again, just some of the basic anatomy of the kidney, and then each of our bars over the renal artery, i.e. pre-renal, and then diseases of the kidney, proper renal diseases, and then bars, of course, over the renal vein and the uh, ureter. So this classification of renal failure makes a lot more sense. There are many diseases that affect the kidney proper, and most of those you'll learn from Robin's pathology textbook. So we won't go into all of those here. Um, remember that pre-renal azotemia is a rise in the BU and a creatinine ratio of greater than 20 to 1, or depending on your source, 10 to 1. But the point is not lost. A rise in the BUN, a rise in the blood urea nitrogen alone, without a change in the creatinine, would suggest that the nitrogenous waste are rising, but the serum creatinine, breakdown of muscle tissue, is proceeding normally. So what would cause such a rise in the BUN while leaving the creatinine alone? Well, first, it could be a high-protein diet. You know those protein shakes that they promote at GNC Nutrition stores? Those can raise your BUN and cause a sense of dehydration, not enough water, 
and the nitrogen is, is absorbed faster than the body can excrete it. Usually, um, though, pre-renal causes, as shown in the photo, is due to renal artery stenosis, hypotension, dehydration, or just too much protein in your diet. Um, how is uh, renal uh, artery stenosis dealt with? Most of the time, once it's diagnosed and as the cause of the patient's hypertension, um, a catheter can be slid into the renal artery um, and blown up, and uh, a balloon can uh, dilate the artery and a stent can be put in. So here is uh, an example of that. Atherosclerotic disease in an artery and a nitinol stent is put in. So pre-renal causes BUN creatinine ratio of greater than 10 to 1, 20 to 1. The point is BUN is way out of proportion to the creatinine. So we covered this earlier in another slide, and this is the manner in which the body repairs dehydration or hypotension or drop in the afferent blood into the kidney via the renal artery. It takes both the kidney to secrete renin and the lungs to provide the uh, ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme, for the process of reabsorption of sodium, and then water follows by osmosis back into the body. Don't forget, Postoperative SIADH is a major player, is a major player in postoperative patients who've lost blood. SIADH, the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. It's a major player in post-op patients who've lost blood, who have sustained hypotension, or just have the undue stress of surgery. Epinephrine and vasopressin mediated vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. Um, ACE inhibitor drugs. A side effect is cough. Think about that for a minute. Um, ACE is made in the lungs, and a side effect of inhibiting the ACE uh, enzyme is a cough. Uh, prevents the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. So an ACE inhibitor works here, and subsequently you have a decrease in water reabsorption and, in effect, promote a type of dehydration, uh, if you will. So uh, let's uh, look at this in a little more detail. So we have several images here, CTAs and some MRAs, CT angiograms and MR angiograms, that show us renal artery stenosis. It's likely that these patients suffered from hypertension. So should we order an MRA or a CTA on each and every patient that suffers from hypertension? No, but ordering a renal, a renal ultrasound, which is quicker and cheaper, isn't a bad idea, especially if you can hear an abdominal brewery or a brewery in the flank or their hypertension is not responding to your medications. Um, other causes, rare, but need to be considered would be a pheochromocytoma, a tumor, uh, which is a tumor of the adrenal gland, carcinoid syndrome, um, which uh, you'll learn about or uh, hopefully have learned about, um, et cetera. So these are some of the various causes of uh, hypertension related to the kidney. So here we have a renal artery stenosis here. Over here, we have a very thin uh, area going into the left kidney. And here on the bottom, we can see uh, here is an area of renal artery stenosis right here. And here's after an angioplasty balloon has been inserted to open it up. So again, we need to just follow this through and memorize this because this is important. So the body's response to hypotension or not enough blood to the kidney, the kidney causes an excretion of renin. Renin uh, then causes angiotensin to be, or, um, angiotensinogen to be converted to angiotensin one. And then angiotensin converting enzyme from the lungs causes angiotensin two to be created. That causes thirst, vasoconstriction, and sodium absorption, uh, which are things that we um, don't really want if somebody is already hypertensive, hence the reason that we give them an ACE inhibitor. We don't want angiotensin around to make someone who's hypertensive to, to drink and to have more vasoconstriction because they already have that already. Uh, and then, of course, the body will turn towards the production of aldosterone, which works uh, also uh, in uh, the uh, body to help sodium reabsorption and potassium reabsorption and water retention. So aldosterone uh, uh, acts on the uh, adrenal gland and uh, it, it acts peripherally to cause in the kidney uh, sodium reabsorption and potassium reabsorption water retention. These are things that we don't want in somebody who has 
high blood pressure. So just as a summary of what we've been discussing, notice that ADH, antidiuretic hormone, this, its action is by water reabsorption. Whereas aldosterone and angiotensin II work by sodium and water reabsorption. Atrial natriuretic peptide increases blood volume but leads to a decrease in sodium and water reabsorption. We won't discuss uh, atrial natriuretic peptide here anymore. Um, so let's, took, let's take a look after surgery. So after surgery, in the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, SIADH, the body holds on to water, and then we have to wait three or four days to the body to mobilize the fluid into the vasculature so that it, the excess fluid can be urinated out. So this is a big one. You will be asked a million times in your career, doctor, can you please come and see Mr. or Mrs. X? He just has colon removed today and he isn't making any urine. Uh, you need to know how much urine did he make? When was his surgery? Was it today? Was it yesterday? Was it three days ago? Has he been hypotensive? If not, you don't need to do anything. Reassure the nurse that he's in SIADH. Explain what this is to her because she won't know. And tell her that any extra fluid or diuretics would, at this stage, make his post-op course more rocky and make him more edematous in the next day or two. It's okay to do nothing sometimes. Give the body a chance to catch up. Don't always reach for the Lasix or furosemide. Don't always reach for Lasix if your patient isn't peeing. Think about other causes. Remember, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. So this is important, syndrome of inappropriate ADH. You will see this in post-op patients. And if you go into internal medicine or family medicine, you will also see uh, SIADH and you'll be consulted to treat those patients who have a low urine output. Sometimes the best thing is just let the body do what it needs to do. So let's look at this slide to review the many causes of pre-renal kidney failure. So interestingly, note that septic shock the mechanism of pre-renal failure is vasodilatation, which drops the blood pressure. So in septic shock, we get systemic vasodilatation, and that causes a drop in blood pressure. But the body will compromise eventually and try to vasoconstrict, trying to raise the blood pressure, increasing the afterload uh, in order to increase the blood pressure. But it does this to the detriment of the kidneys. It shunts blood to the brain and the core at the expense of the kidneys. Eventually, the body then won't be able to compensate anymore and full-blown vasodilatation occurs. At this point, the patient is usually put on pressors like norepinephrine or dopamine or dobutamine after they've already tried aggressive rehydration with fluids or blood and it doesn't work. So, of course, a drop in preload, a drop in your fluid status from, say, diarrhea, vomiting, uh, overdiuresis, a burn injury, dehydration, can lead to volume depletion. The interesting thing about burns is they kill the kidney by plugging up the ducts with myoglobin. And the treatment for the burn patient is aggressive hydration, making the urine alkali to improve uh, the dissolving of the myoglobin. And you might even have to use mannitol, which acts as an osmotic diuretic to the kidney. Now think about hypoalbuminemia. So these patients are unable to keep an intravascular colloid pressure and hold solubles in water within the vascular system as such they third space their fluid and it causes peripheral edema. And this fluid is of no use to the kidneys because it isn't in the vasculature. Thus the kidney sees this as a type of dehydration. Your patient can actually be volume overloaded and yet be dehydrated intravascularly. Stop and think about that for a minute. Is your patient volume overloaded or does he just, is he third spacing the fluid? Dehydration versus um, third spacing versus um, not being uh, in the vasculature. Think about this for a sec. You can be uh, dehydrated and yet have edema. So think about that. So then there's a drop in blood pressure from a heart attack or congestive heart failure or cardiomyopathy. And then again, the kidney sees all of this, is, this hypotension and goes into fluid saving mode. Albumin isn't there either, so the fluid goes into this useless edema that the body can't use and not fluid into the vasculature. So in pre-renal azotemia, 
which means an increase in the BUN, and pre-renal acute kidney injury are conditions that are caused from the temporary or intermittent lack of renal perfusion, hypoperfusion. So, of course, when the kidney senses it's not getting enough blood, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system kicks in, as does the production of antidiuretic hormone. We see a low urine output, decreased concentration of urine sodium, compared to renal injury, which should uh, cause a loss of sodium more than normal and a high urine osmolality. So, again, pre-renal you're going to see a low volume of urine output, a decreased concentration of urine sodium, and a high urine osmolality. So I'm sorry about this being on its side. The best way is to look at the PowerPoint and spin this slide around and enlarge it. Um, we'll use these to help us investigate the causes of renal failure, acute kidney injury. In renal failure, not pre or post, the BUN usually rises together, but in a ratio of less than 10 to 1. For example, a BUN creatinine ratio today of 10 to 1 and tomorrow of 15 to 3 would suggest renal failure. The acute tripling of the serum creatinine is suggesting the kidney can't excrete the creatinine from the body, from the body's normal everyday breakdown of muscle products, and it's building up. Then tomorrow it might be 30 to 5. That High ratio, BU in a 30, creatinine a 5. Same thing, think renal failure. Watch that creatinine. It will tell you more than the BUN alone. So what's the number one cause of a low serum BUN? This is an easy question. Malnutrition, not enough protein on board. Um, I have had nurses call and tell me that the patient's BUN was critically low. And I say, thank you. Uh, hang a phone up and tell them to feed the patient. Give the patient some protein if they can. That's the number one cause of a low BUN. Okay, so there are two different uh, ways to look at a kidney, acute kidney injury, two different sets of criteria, and they are remarkably similar. So the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes Guideline, KDIGO, don't memorize that, uh, and then the RIFLE criteria. So, of course, intrinsic damage to the kidney or uh, infrarenal, intrarenal, sorry, intrarenal acute kidney injury can be divided into, these, into diseases that affect three major structures within the nephron. If it affects the tubules, we get acute tubular necrosis, which is a misnomer. It's most commonly caused by sepsis or ischemia or toxins or drugs or myoglobin. Then there's disease of the interstitium of the kidney itself. Uh, an example is acute interstitial nephritis. Um, and it can commonly occur as a result of allergies to drugs. And then, of course, there's damage to the glomeruli proper. So, of course, the treatment for acute kidney injury is careful attention to the patient's uh, fluid volume, the electrolyte status, and anticipate dialysis if necessary. Sadly, many of the purported drugs that we've tried um, do not help. Things like dopamine, diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, in acetylcysteine, which we mentioned for uh, giving patients potentially before they get a CAT scan uh, to prevent um, damage to the uh, kidney from uh, the contrast agents. Um, of course, HL natriuretic peptide, sodium bicarb, antioxidants, even, and even EPO. They've all been selected to try to help uh, the kidney when it's in kidney failure. None of them have uh, worked very well. On the other hand, keeping the intraoperative blood pressure greater than 55 millimeters of mercury for a mean arterial pressure, that's not your systolic, your diastolic, that's a mean arterial pressure, helps prevent acute kidney injury. So avoiding non-steroidal drugs, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, avoid aminoglycosides, beta-lactam antibiotics, vanco, ampho, and sulfonamides can also help prevent acute kidney injury. And now we're back to what fluids should be used uh, to help resuscitate a patient in acute uh, kidney uh, injury. Normal saline, uh, which I taught you uh, in the treatment of shock, is the preferred method of resuscitation, the preferred fluid. But normal saline has been uh, shown to cause a hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic, 
metabolic acidosis. Think about that for a minute. I give you a whole ton of saline, but it makes you hyperkalemic. However, other fluids did not really show any benefit. There's no benefit from lactated ringers or albumin or Hespan, which is a starch, uh, hydroxyethyl starch, something like that is what it stands for. Avoiding the use of diuretics is also a good thing, except when the patient is truly fluid overloaded. Uh, and then you might need to use diuretic in someone who actually has acute kidney injury if they're truly fluid overload. Of course, it goes without saying that iodine-containing contrast agents shouldn't be used in a patient with the signs of impending renal compromise. The previous use of uh, N-acetylcysteine was promoted along with pre-procedure IV hydration and bicarb to help prevent contrastive-induced uh, nephropathy. However, trials have shown that N-acetylcysteine was a disappointment. So recommending it as a solid, hard recommendation doesn't exist. It's easy to give and it carries minimal risk, so many radiologists will still recommend its use in a pre-CAT scan setting to uh, help hydration of the kidney. So uh, when do we recommend dialysis, called renal replacement therapy? When do we recommend dialysis? Well, there's a mnemonic, A-E-I-O-U, A for acidosis, E for electrolyte abnormalities, C for uh, intoxication by toxins that can hurt the kidney, like um, antifreeze, and overload, volume overload, uh, pulmonary edema, unresponsive to our diuretics. These patients might need um, dialysis. And the presence of uremia, which causes uh, an encephalopathy, pericarditis, or uh, bleeding. So let's take a look at this slide real quick and just pay attention to the similarities here between diagnosing acute kid kidney injury. So if we have an increase in the serum creatinine by 0.3 or more within two days, or if the serum creatinine goes up by one and a half or greater than baseline the past seven days, and if we look across here, we can see, well, the rifle criteria says you have, you're at risk of kidney injury if your creatinine goes up one and a half and you're, you have injury if it goes up two and a half and you're in failure if it goes up three times at normal serum creatinine. And then, of course, if your urine output drops less than 0.5 per meal per kilogram per hour for six hours straight. And over here in the rifle criteria, they say if you have loss of function for greater than four weeks or end-stage renal disease is considered to have set in, if uh, you have an elevated serum creatinine that meet these criteria uh, for greater than three months or a drop in your GFR or your urine output criteria. Basically, in summary, acute kidney injury, watch the serum creatinine. If it goes up, um, keep an eye on them, you're in trouble. In post-renal failure, we're generally looking at failure of the kidney secondary to an obstruction distal to the kidney itself. Pinching of the ureter by a stone or a tumor is an example. In men, prostatic hypertrophy becomes the major source of urinary obstruction and subsequent elevation in serum creatinine. In pregnant women, the uterus can pinch the ureters in the pelvis at the pelvic brim and cause a transient hydronephrosis. And let's not forget the venous output of the kidney too. For every red cell that comes into the kidney via the renal artery, the corresponding amount of blood as venous blood should come out and drain back into the inferior vena cava. Don't forget the gonadal vein on the left drains into the left renal vein. So nutcracker syndrome could result in varicosities of the renal veins and of the gonadal veins. Of course, these vascular venous tributaries could result in a backward flow through the collaterally smaller veins and not impede the venous output of the kidney at all. Maybe that's why nutcracker syndrome just isn't that common. Uh, in this image, we can see a bladder stone or a ureteral stone uh, causing blockage of the kidney. Strictures from surgery can also cause uh, hydronephrosis, um, usually treated by placement of a stent into the kidney. Um, check out my YouTube video if you'd like to see stents being put uh, into and up the ureters. And of course, we have to mention uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy and how that can cause an outflow obstruction. And let's not forget the usually normal hydronephrosis of pregnancy. I've put an old paper in the mix for you to review. I've pre-read it so you don't have to. Um, and I've highlighted the important uh, passages.
It talks about the pain, discomfort, and chronic urinary tract infections as a result of the uh, pregnancy state. It's a bit dated, but it is a, a good uh, literature review for this uh, aspect of normal physiology that can cause a hydronephrosis. So one of the ways to treat obstruction uh, by the ureter is by placing a silastic or plastic stent into the ureter and past the point of obstruction. You can see that if you visit my YouTube channel. This allows the kidney to decompress, but they're put in under general anesthesia and it makes the patient prone to infection. Of course, using a Foley catheter in an older male, placing it past the bladder ne neck obstruction secondary to the enlarged prostate gland can be a godsend. If the prostate gland is too large and a Foley catheter can't be used, then filiform dilators can be used uh, or a Coudé tip catheter, sometimes uh, helpful in maneuvering the catheter past the bladder neck obstruction due to BPH. Of course, if a urologist can't put a catheter in, he or she might try a uh, suprapubic urinary catheter. That, of course, would be a, a last-ditch uh, effort. You can see these in the photos here. Here we have filiform catheters um, that can be placed uh, into the uh, urethra. Here's a regular Foley catheter. This Foley catheter has three ports. One is used for irrigation. One is used to fill the balloon of the catheter and keep it in. And of course, the other allows the urine to drain into a bag. Here's a Foley catheter placed into uh, a male patient with the balloon blowed up into the uh, bladder. Here's a straight tip Foley catheter, and this is called a Coudé tip. This is not minutia. You're going to see these when you're an intern. You're probably going to use one when you're an intern. So you need to know about a Coudé tip uh, catheter. And then, of course, if uh, the bladder is giant uh, and we uh, have to get in a uh, catheter but we can't otherwise, we can sometimes put a suprapubic catheter in. Um, this is best done to the surgical resident or the urologist, but it, if the bladder is truly very large, um, these are also relatively easy to do. Um, here, this image shows us the filiform catheters, these guys here, um, and how they're placed into the bladder. These tiny little catheters screw into each other. So you insert the smallest one first, and then you screw into the base of the catheter another dilator just a little bit larger in size. And then you successfully put them in until they dilate the uh, bladder neck obstruction here where the uh, prostatic urethra is, and you can eventually get a uh, catheter into that bladder. Um, one of the things that I do want to talk about is that there is a problem called postoperative diuresis, and this is very real. So let's say a male patient comes in with severe urinary retention from benign prostatic hypertrophy. His prostate's the size of a basketball and he can't pee. So we put in a Foley, we can't get it in. We try coup de tip, doesn't work. Then we try the filiform dilators um, that I, I just mentioned. And we finally get the prostatic urethra and bladder neck obstruction relieved and allow the urine to flow. Our patient hasn't peed in over 24 hours and it feels so good for him to urinate and we want him to help and we want to help him, and so we drain his bladder. Okay, big mistake. I'm um, sorry, I called it post-operative diuresis. Uh, it's not. It's post-obstructive diuresis. So this is a very real problem. So th this patient comes in. Um, then there's a problem called post-obstructive diuresis. This is very real. Let's say a male patient comes in with severe urinary retention from BPH. His prostate's the size of a basketball and he can't pee. We put in a Foley, we can't get it in. We try a Coudé tip, doesn't work. Then we try the filiform dilators. Um, finally, we get the uh, prostatic urethra cannulated and the bladder neck obstruction relieved and allow the urine to flow. Our patient hasn't peed in over 24 hours and it feels so good for him to pee and we want to help him. So we drain his bladder. Big mistake. Drain it slowly, about 200 cc's at a time. Because if you don't, his kidneys will begin to spontaneously diurese. Remember, he's had a post-obstructive physiology that has allowed urine to continue to be filtrated, but the urine has not been able to get out of the ureters. So... He will start urinating like crazy. 
and become dehydrated. And this will show up as a hypernatremia and a hyperchloremia and maybe even a hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. This so-called post-obstructive diuresis and electrolyte shift can cause your patient to have a seizure. The hypernatremia can cause a seizure bad enough, and if you don't recognize it, your patient could die. Um, I've attached two articles about this. So this is also an area where you have to think about post-obstructive issues in renal failure. Now let's talk about a very clinically relevant medication called erythropoietin. Uh, we know that erythropoietin is made by the kidney, a uh, glycoprotein that acts on the bone marrow to produce red cells. It helps the body maintain a proper level of red cell volume in the blood. A patient uh, who has acute kidney failure may not make any uh, erythropoietin or any erythropoiesis stimulating agents, ESAs and thus they may have a chronic anemia. Interestingly though, it is given to, to uh, treat patients whose hemoglobin is greater than 10 but less than 13 if they're going to have a non-cardiac operation. But giving erythropoietin alpha was not shown to approve any mortality except in a, some very small subgroups of trauma patients. Further, it is not indicated for use in the intensive care unit where you might have a lot of patients in renal failure and might be having dialysis. Further, um, it should be viewed as a method of increasing the hemoglobin in an anemic patient with kidney failure on a more elective basis. And one of the side effects of these uh, erythropoietic stimulating agents is hypertension. 20% of patients develop hypertension when treated. So we need to keep in mind that it's useful for a patient who has chronic anemia, but useful for a patient who has end-stage renal disease who isn't making this, but not in a patient who is in an ICU who is acutely ill or is going to have a cardiac surgery. This is a reserve for mostly elective um, reproduction of our red cell mass. Okay, break out your calculators. Um, this is called the FINA. This is a calculation that will help you to determine whether or not your patient is in renal failure, pre-renal, or even post-renal. So, of course, before we can even talk about the FENA, the fractional excretion of sodium, we have to remember the kidney's role in acid-base balance. It acts by the reclamation of sodium bicarb via carbonic anhydrase and the excretion of acid. Remember that the excretion absorption of acid is via a sodium, uh, sodium potassium exchange mechanism. Sodium is reabsorbed, acid is secreted and bicarb follows the sodium. Then the acid is sent out as a waste product and it joins ammonia to become ammonium. Of course, it isn't this simple, but you get the idea. So how does the fractional excretion of sodium help us in the care of the patient? It helps to figure out if your patient's kidneys are failing. If you look in the comment section on the PowerPoint, you'll see a link to a calculator that will calculate the FINA for you. The FENA is really only useful in patients with oliguria, an acute injury to the kidney, without any recent use of diuretics, a history of chronic renal disease, urinary tract obstructions, or acute glomerular disease. If you know all that your patient has all of these problems, don't use a FENA. It won't be accurate. But if your patient's serum sodium is too low, so they're losing sodium in the urine, that's a sign there's a kidney damage. Keep this formula in your back pocket, especially if you're unsure if your patient is actually has compromised renal function. Normally, your kidney should be able to hold on to sodium. But if you're losing too much sodium in the urine and your serum level of sodium is low and you start seizing from hyponatremia, you can also seize from hypernatremia, it's likely your kidney has lost its sodium hydrogen exchange pump and is losing sodium into the urine. So your fractional excretion of sodium is usually less than 1%. For the most part, a normal kidney should hold on to uh, all of its sodium. And the fractional excretion of sodium greater than 1% in an acutely azotemic patient, one whose BUN is elevated, usually indicates intrinsic renal injury, but is consistent with volume depletion in patients who've had diuretics or in some patients with chronic renal insufficiency.
So go to the link, click on it, and you can see how the, the fractional excretion of sodium is actually calculated. So you've seen this slide before, and I want to go through it because if you don't know this slide, then I haven't done my job in teaching you this stuff on how to take care of your patient. So items to memorize. You have to know that a normal urine output is between a half and one cc per kilogram per hour. Fractional excretion of sodium normally needs to be less than 1%. You can use a calculator or look that up. You don't have to memorize that. Um, it is the sodium in the urine times the creatinine in plasma or the serum divided by the sodium in the plasma times the creatinine in the urine times 100. The number one cause of a low BUN is malnutrition. A BUN creatinine ratio of greater than 15 to 20 to 10 to 1 is prerenal. If BUN and creatinine are the same, if they're going up equally and your ratio is uh, 1 to 1, in other words, if your BUN is 10 and your creatinine is 10, you probably have renal failure. If the creatinine rises out of proportion to the BUN, you probably have renal failure. We don't recommend dialysis unless the patient's creatinine is about 13 or so. And then for every increase in creatinine by one, we decrease our kidney function by a half. So let, let me say this again because kids have a hard time with this one. It's really easy. Creatinine that's normal is one. Tomorrow, your creatinine's two that means you've lost half of your renal function. So you start out with two kidneys. Let's pretend now you're down to one kidney. So tomorrow, your creatinine is three. Now you have half of what you had before. So we had started out with two kidneys. We went from one to two, we lost a kidney. Two to three, we're going to lose half of another kidney. Three to four, we're going to lose half of the half. You get it? It's really important to understand this. So every increase in the creatinine by one represents a decrease in previous kidney function by one half. And in normal specific gravity is 1010. Normal density of urine is 1010. Use that as your reference. If your urine is uh, more dense than that, you could be having a concentrated urine, or if it's less dense than that, um, you may have a very dilute urine. So what would you normally see in a patient who has renal failure? So we learned that the fractional excretion of sodium is normally less than one, but let's say we run a fraction of excretion of sodium and it comes back at 5%. Your kidney's failing, it can't hold on to sodium. So the sodium will be excreted into the urine and your body cannot um, regulate this anymore and it can't concentrate its urine. So the urine in a patient uh, who has kidney failure, you might actually have a very dilute urine that has a lot of sodium in it um, because they can't concentrate. They can't pull anything out of it to save it. Um, and then of course, you have hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. But if you learn this little mnemonic by hypokalemic, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, um, hopefully that'll help you uh, remember that if your potassium is high and your chloride's high, you're going to be acidotic. If your serum potassium is low and your chloride is low, you're going to be alkalotic. So let's talk about kidney transplants. Most of you actually don't know this, that when somebody has a kidney transplant, the kidney is removed from the donor and placed into the pelvis of the recipient. That We don't put it back up here. Um, that's where we take the normal kidney out of from somebody who's donated a kidney. And then we sew in into the retroperitoneum, we don't even have to get near the guts. We can just make a flank incision, move the peritoneal lining over, move the trash can lining over. And as we move that trash can lining over, we can expose the retroperitoneal structures of the common iliac vein uh, or the uh, internal and external iliac veins. And so our respective renal artery, renal vein in, and we can plug in the ureter into the uh, bladder. So again, note the transplanted kidneys put in the pelvis. The diseased kidney is typically left in place. We don't go and remove their kidneys because you never know. Maybe the transplant will help these others heal. Um, it, it, stranger things have happened. Ureter of the transplanted kidneys reimplanted. And when they harvest the kidney, they should be sure to leave the gonadal arteries intact. 
so that the person's kidney who you are taking doesn't come out and lose their ovary or lose their testes as a result of donating a kidney. And interestingly, the glomerular filtration rate would be expected to be about 50%, right? Um, because uh, after you've taken one of my kidneys, you would think my GFR now is half because I've only got one of two kidneys. It isn't. It should be expected to be at about 70%. There's some hypertrophy that occurs uh, when uh, you take my kidney. And uh, so I'm the kidney donor. I've only got one good kidney left. My GFR goes up to about 70% of what it was. So here's just some more pictures showing the same thing, uh, showing how the renal artery and the renal vein are anastomosed uh, into the il internal iliac artery. And here, it's difficult to see from this photograph, but you can see the kidney here. Um, and they're sewing in, here's uh, the artery and the vein they're trying to sew in. It's not a good picture. You can't really see the uh, internal iliac artery or vein, but you get the idea. So now let's do some questions and put all this together. So make sure that you understand the purpose of this whole talk was to be able to take care of patients and not worry about the minutia. So we got a 22 year old marathon contestant who presents to urgent care complaining of nausea, vomiting, and generalized body aches. And he comes in, his vital signs is he's 22 years old, his blood pressure is 90 over 70, he's a little low, his heart rate's 70, interesting, he's not tachycardic, um, low-grade fever, respirations are okay, his urine-specific gravity is 1.020, so his urine's concentrated. So based on this and his electrolytes, what do we think? Well, this guy is suffering from uh, dehydration because he just ran a marathon and he's been puking. So interestingly, look at his potassium. His potassium is low at 2.9. Why is that? Well, he's got concentrated urine and that's because he's been able to uh, hold on to his sodium and hopefully uh, pee out some of the acid from his running because this guy is going to have an acidosis from running and uh, using his muscle tissues and the lactic acid, etc. But he's going to be breathing faster, so he's going to have a compensated uh, metabolic acidosis. But that's beside the point. This guy comes in, his potassium is low because he's been vomiting, and his acid is low because he's been losing stomach acid. Okay, so his acid is low, his potassium is low, and his creatinine and his BUN are both high, but they're high in proportion to one another. They are actually here about um, uh, 20 to one, so pre-renal. So he's pre-renal, he's dehydrated, he's lost acid, and he's lost potassium. So he's going to be hypokalemic, hypochloremic, metabolic alkalosis with a compensated, probably a compensated acidosis, He's been holding on to his sodium. He's been peeing out his acid. He's also been losing acid by, by vomiting. And then is he pre-renal, renal, or post-renal? Well, at this stage, um, he's pre-renal. He needs fluids and potassium replacement. He has a respiratory compensation of his metabolic acidosis, but he's been losing so much acid and potassium by vomiting that he's alkalotic. So at this stage, our boy here is alkalotic, right? I hope this makes sense. Read the comments to this slide if you uh, don't quite follow this. All right, let's look at another one. So here we got grandma, 73-year-old diabetic female, presents with palpitations, twitching, fasciculations, and fatigue. She's on dialysis, and she's, but she's not had any dialysis in the past four days. She's also anemic. Why is grandma anemic? Okay, here's her vital signs. Uh, blood pressure, she's hypertensive at 160 over 95. Her heart rate's 95, her temperature's okay, her respirations are okay, pulse ox is okay. So she's hypertensive, she's got palpitations, fasciculations, I'll bet her potassium is too high because she hasn't had dialysis. So let's draw some blood on her. Yep, sure enough, potassium is way high, 6.8. Um, BU and creatinine, check that out. Big time elevated creatinine, out of proportion to the BUN. So she's in renal failure, we know that because she's on dialysis. Her creatinine is not 13, it probably was at one time, but through years of dialysis, maybe it's come down to 6.7. Um, so she's in renal failure and she's hyperkalemic. So we gotta dialyze her and get rid of that. What's another thing that we can do to drop someone's 
uh, serum potassium. We give them glucose and then we chase it with a shot of insulin. And what that does is insulin uh, and glucose will force the potassium into the cell and you get a little cardioprotective effect so the potassium doesn't cause those arrhythmias. So you can give her oral k it, It's like these crystals that absorb potassium, but it is also really constipating. Don't know if, if grandma can tolerate that. But for now, we need to dialyze her. And what's going on here? Is she renal, post-renal, pre-renal? What is it? She's renal, creatinine, and BUN way out of proportion to one another. Is she acidotic, hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic, metabolic acidosis? So grandma's going to be acidotic. And then what would you expect her urinalysis to show? Um, grandma really can't make urine. That's why she's on um, dialysis. So what if we do a FENA? Well, she's already on dialysis. She may not be a good example to use to calculate the FENA. But remember, she should be able to hold on to sodium. But in this case, she probably can't. She's probably going to pee out a lot of sodium. She can't concentrate her urine. So the truth is, she's going to have um, an inability to resorb her sodium. And she's also going to try to pee out potassium, but she can't do it enough. Um, she's going to make a little urine that she can't concentrate. So I would uh, expect her to not make very much urine. But what she does make would be pretty dilute. I want you to think about that for a minute. It doesn't make a lot of urine, but what she does make is pretty dilute because she can't hold on to the sodium um, because of the kidney failure. And the sodium and the potassium go together. Um, so renal failure, dialysis, hyperkalemic, hyperchloremic, metabolic acidosis. One more example here. So... Uh, we got this old guy who, uh, after surgery for an inguinal hernia, elderly male patient with known uh, BPH, that's a big prostate, is sent home from the outpatient surgical center that evening, some nine hours later. He can't pee. Prior to surgery, he would void four to five times each night. So here's a CT scan that somebody got on him. We're not sure why they needed that. But you can see right away this bladder is giant. His prostate gland down here actually looks to me in this picture like there's an abscess in the prostate gland. So that's sort of just a weird finding. We could, uh, if I can't get a catheter in, I could poke a needle in and do a suprapubic catheter. But, so what's wrong with this patient? Why can't he urinate? He has post-obstruction renal failure. So he has obstruction of the, bl of the bladder neck at the prostatic urethra. What's the treatment? Let's put a catheter in, okay? Um, and then what, what would you likely see on his blood test? His creatinine would probably be, assuming it was normal to begin with, it might be 1.5, 1.6, something like that, 1.8. Uh, and it'll come down once we allow him to uh, finally drain that urine. So on this guy, we're going to put in a catheter, and we're going to drain it slowly so that he does not get post-obstructive diuresis. So he's going to end up being coming, if we just put the catheter in and drain it, he's going to become hypernatremic and he's going to have a seizure. Okay. Um, so this is somebody that if they come into your ER, you might put the catheter in and let him sit there and drain it slowly and then send him home with a catheter attached to a leg bag uh, in the morning so he can leave that catheter in. Now, this brings an interesting uh, point to mind, and that is I was always taught in these guys who have BPH and giant bladders that you shouldn't fix the hernias until you fix the BPH. So, in other words, let's go fix his big prostate, make sure he doesn't have prostate cancer, prostate abscess. And once we've taken care of his bladder neck obstruction, then we can go fix his hernias and he won't have this problem after surgery. He'll be able to urinate just like he normally would. Um, so prior to surgery, he would void four to five times a night right there. This guy is not getting any sleep. Um, he's getting up all night to pee. And now you fixed his hernia. Now he can't pee at all. 
and some idiot's going to come in and put a Foley catheter in and drain it out. And the next thing is grandpa's going to have a seizure because they didn't know about post-obstructive diuresis. Okay, that completes it. I uh, hope you learned something. Make sure you memorize uh, that one uh, slide. If you have any questions, hit me with an email. I hope this makes it easier than learning all of an incredible amount of minutia that goes with renal disease. If you can understand everything in this lecture, you should be able to take care of your patient when you're an intern. And when the nurse calls and asks you uh, what to do about Mr. Smith not peeing, you're going to ask a couple of questions. How old is he? Did he have surgery? If so, what was it? When's the last time that he did urinate? Does he have a catheter in? How much has he urinated? Um, what are his electrolytes? And what's his ideal body weight? And does he have SIADH or is he truly dehydrated? Or has someone given him uh, not enough diuretic? So a lot of questions. A nurse can make one phone call to drive you crazy, but now you know how to handle it. So thanks for listening. Hope it helped.